Welcome to the lecture on scientific writing. First, a little bit of a disclaimer that uh, some of the things I'm going to tell you about are controversial, particularly in the writing community and particularly to people that spend a lot of time writing and really care whether or not you use which or that or dangling participles or whatever. And uh, sometimes that stuff is important, sometimes it's not. Uh, but my writing style is idiosyncratic, as is everybody's, and there are many ways to write well. But importantly, while there are many ways to write well, there are an infinite number of ways to write poorly. Uh, the goal of scientific writing is persuasion. So a lot of times we think that the goal of our, uh, the goal of our writing is just to get our results uh, down on paper and to send it off into the ether and we hope that somebody reads it. Uh, and really we're just looking for another kind of notch in our belt um, to, uh, to, because as, the, as the, uh, the adage from my PhD advisor goes, not everybody can read, but everyone can count, as in the number of your publications or, uh, or published output. So the, the goals are persuasion. You want to teach somebody your results. Sometimes you want to get a paper accepted. Sometimes you want to get funding. So writing is the principal way by which uh, project proposals, and that's at a company or in an academic lab, get, uh, get, get attention and get funded. So if you know how to communicate, you can get inside the, um, the uh, minds of your readers, then you can persuade them that your way is, uh, is the right way. So, like I said, um, I, I think that, at least, at least in some delusion in, in, in my head, uh, it's actually my writing ability, not my scientific ability, that's, that's permitted some amount of differentiation um, that has helped me in my, uh, in my career. So, but my approach should not be taken as the final word. These are just, I'm just hoping over the next 35 minutes to, to save you some, some time uh, in the future and uh, maybe make you some money as well. Okay, so we all remember these posters from our uh, classrooms in fifth grade. This is the scientific method. The first thing we need to do is to really internalize the scientific method. And it seems ridiculous, but uh, <laughs> because this is the first thing we learn about science, but it's also the first thing we forget about science. Um, we, we get so caught up in the bookkeeping aspect that we lose track of the fact that there should be a hypothesis, some kind of explanatory mechanism that around which the whole project is organized. And if you have that organizational principle that starts with a good core hypothesis, then you are in much uh, better, better shape. So what is a good hypothesis? It's a good project is organized at least or around at least one of them, one solid one, and perhaps some uh, peripheral hypotheses. And coming up with an elegant hypothesis is the key to doing good research. But it's also the hardest thing to come up with when, uh, when prompted. So for example, um, like a melody in, uh, in, in music, like... Uh, so that that is like five notes, right? But it probably took John Williams uh, weeks before that just that came to him. But it's the the theme around which the entire uh, the entire soundtrack to the most popular movie series of all time uh, is organized. A hypothesis. What is it? It's a proposed explanation based on existing evidence. And in basic research, so we have sort of basic research and we have application-driven research or a mix of the two. Ideally, you have an application that's, uh, that's, that's compelling enough to, to garner public support and public funding, uh, but also leads you to, uh, to creating new knowledge using basic science. Uh, but in basic research, one puts forth a mechanism or pathway to explain a phenomenon. And say in the applied side, in engineering, you have a device or a molecule or a system. You want to understand how it works or its mechanism of action. Um, so you hypothesize a solution for how it should work. And then only uh, when, you, when you have this hypothesis can you, uh, can you 
Can you engineer it? Can you tweak it to make it better in certain, uh, in certain other circumstances? And can you take that approach and apply it to other systems that may share characteris characteristics of the system that you studied? Sometimes uh, a lazy hypothesis is that we hypothesize that our idea will work. And that's not a, that's not a, a, a legitimate uh, hypothesis because you can't really build any intellectual <laughs> structure around that. My synthetic sequence will work. That's my hypothesis. That's not a, that's not a hypothesis. Uh, a, a hypothesis works its way into the scientific uh, process in a couple of different ways. I mean, the, the, the real world scientific process where you apply for grants and write papers or write project proposals for your, uh, your company. Um, you have a hypothesis beforehand or, or, um, or, or in, a, in a paper afterwards. And the hypothesis is, the, is really the, the crux of the logical argument um, with which the outcomes of the proposed experiments either support or refute the hypothesis. What I'm saying, you're like, yeah, duh, we know this. We learned it when we were 10 years old. But you would be surprised at how few scientific papers and proposals have an explicit statement of what the organizing principle is of their work. And I would put that, cat that, that number totally unscientifically around 90% don't make an, an explicit statement as to what is the hypothesis. And just writing the word hypothesis doesn't count. Uh, it, ha it has to be, uh, it, it actually has to be a, a hypothesis. And the ones that do include an explicit statement of the hypothesis are always better. Those are the top 10% of proposals and, and scientific papers. So what is a paper? This is my uh, PhD advisor's uh, famous paper in 2004 in Advanced Materials. And a paper, uh, George Whiteside said, is an organized description of hypotheses, data, and conclusions. It's intended to instruct the reader and ultimately to change his or her behavior. Now, that seems a little bit arrogant, right? We're just doing hypothesis, we're just doing s science with some beakers and flasks and columns. And, uh, and NMRs, uh, so how are we changing people's behavior by working in the lab? Well, why does anybody do anything? Why does anybody do engage in any creative act? Because you want somebody else to interpret their results in light of your results. You want them to use your technique. Um, you want them to learn uh, your results for uh, because it could better humanity. The last thing that you want to do is once you have all the data, you collect it up and you collect it, you just put it in a table and kind of write some, you know, some generic prose about it and send it off and hope that somebody is going is, is gonna to be affected by it. And chances are with that approach, they're not going to be. Why do we do, why do we care about papers? Well, unpublished is equal to, to, to non-existent. If it's not published, it's not out there, then it might as well not have been done. It's not simply archival. There has to be a persuasive element to the work, not just tabulating it up. And it's integral to planning and organization of research. So if you start writing early on and you have your hypothesis written down, it's a lot easier to direct your experiments in service of the hypothesis, even if you end up proving a different hypothesis than what you originally put down. It actually prevents drift by being explicit about it as early on in the process as possible. A project is never complete, so you can always do one more experiment. So, uh, and, and really when you decide to write up the results, that's a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a, of a tug of war between um, between expediency and timing, but also making it the most complete thing it could ever possibly be, which by definition will never happen. Um, you'll asymptotically approach the limit of, uh, of the last experiment to do, and you'll never quite get there. 
Okay, it's always helpful to start with an outline where, and this is for any type of writing that you do or any presentation that you do. Just make section head headings. In fact, when I made this PowerPoint presentation, I had this, these little blue banners up here and I just wrote the titles on, on, each, on each banner and then I arranged them and then I made the bullet points and put in the, and put in the figures. So what you, uh, what you do in the outline is you start in the first paragraph that states the hypothesis or the goal. This is not the abstract. This is the first paragraph of the introduction. The figures are really important. So when you're looking at a paper or a textbook chapter, if the figures are crap, um, you're not going to pay any attention to the, to the paper. You'll probably put it down because they're only 24 hours in a day. We're only conscious for uh, 16 of those hours um, or less. And, uh, and we, we have very finite resources for how we're going to spend our time, so you have to make sure that the, uh, that the figures are, are, are catchy, or the figures are, are catchy and self-explanatory. Then put in the section headings and arrange the figures within the section headings and then bullet points about what you're going to say within each section of the paper. The prose comes later. Don't start writing out your results until the organization is how you want it. You may have to reorganize some things later as a result of writing the prose, but it, it, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help anybody to just, just write the whole thing from, from start to finish. Okay, there is a book on writing by Anne Lamott called uh, Bird by Bird, and she had a section in it that you can, uh, that you can download. Well, maybe we can post it on Triton Ed as well. Uh, uh, called Shitty First Drafts. And this is a, uh, has anybody read Shitty First Drafts? The, it's, it's, I really like to, uh, like to embody the, the, the shitty first draft when I sit down to, uh, to compose something for the first time. You start uh, by writing everything you can think of in bullet form, then organize it, not uh, necessarily chronologically. And when you're ready to start drafting prose, get it all down first, no matter how ugly. So here's the outline stage, then arrange it. Then when you start drafting prose, just don't think about the perfect way to write this. Just go, ah, and just write it all down. Just write it all down, and who cares about the grammar and, uh, and the word choice and dangling participles and all that crap. Just write it, just write it all down. Write your first draft as if no one will ever read it. Because no one will ever read it. Although you may be embarrassed by reading your own prose, just like when you're in an empty house and you want to know if anyone else is there, and you say, is anybody here? And you feel like a complete idiot. Um, but I'm sure everybody's done that. Hi, is, are you here? And if you want to say something really stupid, you can say that too because no one's ever going to see it. Then you refine. So it's once, and the good thing about this, psychologically, if you start with a really shitty first draft, everything you do to it, by definition, makes it better. So there's always this sense of progress that you have. Uh, but if you're just sitting there writing one word at a time and deleting it, and then, then uh, it's a lot harder, it's a lot more frustrating to make progress that way. The best writers are avid readers, so follow examples of writing to emulate. Particularly if you're writing a scientific paper, find some science, scientific writers um, that, you, uh, that have a style that is really clear. Like when you read a paper by this author, it's, it's, it's really, uh, really has transparent prose and you understand immediately what they're talking about. What are the components of a paper? So a paper is a layered device for delivering information. Some people just look at the titles. Some people even cite papers only by looking at the titles, a practice which I don't recommend. Then there is the abstract, which is in the title is sort of like an abstract to the abstract. The abstract's the abstract to the paper. Then there's an intro section and a conclusion section. Sometimes people read the intro. Sometimes they also read the conclusions and they skim the figures and that's it. I read the paper. Uh, and for some scenarios, that's fine. What if you, do, what if you only need to know the, the, the final result? What if you don't need to know what they did? Then you have this extra layer of this uh, five to 200 page monstrosity online, which is the supporting information, where the real paper is, where they tell you exactly what they did and in what amounts. So not everyone wants the same level of detail, and you have to appreciate that your reader not all readers are going to want the same level of detail. 
So you have all of these different uh, cascaded pieces of the puzzle. Uh, so the title, abstract conclusions, introduction, experimental design, and results methods all represent different levels of commitment on the part of the reader. You know to really read a scientific paper takes like an hour. How many of us have an hour, right? So, but the specialists in that field will take that time. But it's important for the people that are not going to take all that time that you put in what is expected in each one of these, uh, each one of these sections. There are two types of titles, descriptive titles and catchy title, titles, or a hybrid. One particular catchy title, this is a George Whiteside's paper, How to Make Water Run, uh, Roll Uphill. That was in science uh, like 15 years ago or so. Uh, and then the descriptive type version would be patterning of gradients of hydrophobic potential energy on inclined planes of glass using tridecafluoro, tetrahydroalkyl, trichlorosilane, and how to use them to counterbalance the gravitational force between water and the earth. So there could be some happy medium between here. This is a quite well cited paper, so in this case, this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea. Some other components. Okay, so the abstract in more detail. Abstract comes first, but it's the last thing written. And why is it the last thing written? Because we don't know what's in the paper yet. <laughs> State the problem, one sentence summary, a description of the methodology, and the key results, and be specific. Some and, and that includes key numbers, key values that you, that you obtained as a result of your, uh, of your work. The final sentence in the abstract is helpful to say why one should care about the results, always in the third uh, person. In the American Chemical Society style guide, uh, it's the present, you write the abstract in the present tense. And that's different from the rest of the paper, which is in the past tense. Introduction, eye-catching first sentence, what we did, why we did it, what's new, and who cares. Make sure that you answer these questions as explicitly as possible. Uh, we're also going to distribute the slides and the YouTube videos, so you don't have to feel like you're getting behind writing down everything. Okay. Other components. The background, which comes after the introduction, uh, allows you to make friends with other people in the field, <laughs> uh, literally, by naming them by name. Uh, so and so at all, so and so and coworkers uh, did this, and uh, because of their, uh, their, their work, there are new questions that have come up that we're trying to, uh, trying to answer. What are the holes in the literature in the field, and why is filling those holes important? Like, why justify why you're doing what you're doing? Experimental design sometimes has an explicit section after the background, but before the results. It is uh, not the experimental methods yet. This is just a justification of why you did what you did. If this part is not mentioned explicitly, then sometimes it's part of the background. Results and discussion. What were the results of the measurements and the fabrication procedures? How do the results, how do your results compare to the results or predictions of others? And your conclusions are not simply a summary or recap of the abstract. You see this quite often, and that's actually pretty useless to the field. One, because they can also always scroll up to the abstract and reread that, so why do they need to see it again? The conclusions are your opportunity to say what we learned from a 30,000 foot, like from an airplane perspective. Uh, and what are the, the next steps? What do we need to do to turn this, this thing into, uh, to, to develop this scientific field of which our paper is a part? And how are our results extendable to other systems? What are the shortcomings and what remains to be done? Why is there so much, uh, so much bad writing? Yeah. Um, talk about the conclusion being an opportunity <clears throat> to like, lead research forward. Is there a balance played in the lab between encouraging, uh, talking about the things that need to be done in the future versus wanting to preserve those ideas and not give them away? <laughs> That's a really good question. So are we, are we mortgaging our good ideas by putting them in the abstract? Um, sometimes that's a valid concern, but it also advertises to the community that we may have already been working on this in the background, so don't try to scoop me because in three months I'll have, I'll have the answer. So that's a, that's a, good, it's a good point, and it does, it does come up, but usually I tend to err on the side of giving away a little bit too much just to make it more compelling. I think we can all agree there's a lot of bad scientific writing, so why is it so bad? Uh, well, 
Writing is unnatural, but speaking is natural, but writing is unnatural. In, uh, in speaking, I can talk to you and I can b tell based on your expression whether or not you're on my wavelength. But in writing, you just, <laughs> and you just hope that you'd set it in a way where people will understand. So as a result, you have to err on the side of treating your readers a little bit like a baby. Uh, the writer must imagine the education background and intelligence and prejudices of all possible readers. That's a really hard task, right? Because if it's so jargon laden, then nobody's going to understand what you wrote. The reaction of the unknown reader is the only thing that matters. So the hardest thing to do is actually the only thing that matters. If your writing doesn't persuade your reader, then it's, it's useless. So you, you really have to to have a good theory of mind of your reader in order to be, uh, in order to be effective. So uh, this might go into, uh, into the weeds a little bit, so hopefully some of you kind of like writing, but I'll come out of the, out of the weeds in a moment. So this is uh, work, uh, this is a, an example from this, um, from the, the book, uh, Clear, and, uh, Clear and Simple is the Truth by Thomas and Turner, but I found out about it through the book, um, the Sense of Style by Stephen Pinker, which I think is the best book on nonfiction writing um, perhaps uh, I've, I've ever seen. There's a plain style, which is egalitarian. Uh, everything is in full view. The world is not seen from a particular vantage point. And an example is the early bird gets the worm. Because the bird gets up early and the worms are out early. There's a classic style, which is a little more aristocratic, assumes a little bit more... Uh, probing depth on the part of the, of the reader. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. A little devious, right? There's a practical style, which is most, most of the time scientific writing is in the practical style, but it's sometimes acceptable to be a little classic in your thinking because it makes your work a lot more interesting. The prose is explicit. The bird that sets his alarm for 5 a.m. is likely to find and eat the earthworms. Birds who set their alarms for 6 a.m. are less likely to find earthworms. Assuming, assuming birds can set alarms. Depending on your audience, uh, you might also add, have to add something like, the timing is important becomes, because worms come to the surface after it rains or dews, which often occurs in the early morning. Academies is a language that academic uh, writers adopt, which is quite problematic to, um, to comprehensibility. And one of the characteristics of academies is larding with apologies and compulsive hedging. Using phrases like, to the best of our knowledge, somewhat fairly nearly seemingly, in part relatively, comparatively predominantly, to some extent presumably. Um, like, you're not sure about what you're going to say. Seattle is a relatively rainy city. city. Not compared to Rochester, where I'm from. Unoptimized. Of course it's unoptimized. It's a scientific paper that like one or two students did in a lab with like a budget of a, hundred, a couple hundred K per year. Of course it's unoptimized. More research needs to be done, of course. That's why they call it research. Uh, then there's meta discourse, professional nar narcissism and discourse about discourse. Organic photovoltaic cells have attracted increasing interest of the research community. In recent years, chemists and engineers have turned their attention to, don't be a sheep. Uh, we're not interested in the topic. We're interested in the topic because it's interesting and important, not because other people are interested in it, right? If other people are interested in it, then we just look like a follower. Signposting. Um, if your prose flows naturally and your organization is good, you don't need paragraphs like this. First, I'm going to tell you about carbon. After telling you about carbon, I'm going to switch to sulfur before going on to molybdenum, and then finally we will return to carbon. Again, if your organization of your paper is good, you won't need, to, you won't need, uh, you won't need paragraphs uh, like this. If it's useful to you to plan your work like this, then fine, but I would get rid of it in the final draft. Jargon. Jargon is a particularly bad uh, part of academies. Uh, the nanoparticles were tested in a murine model. Who knows what a murine model is? Mice, rats and mice. 
one might have said so in the first place and saved uh, 18 out of 20 of us the time to look it up because frankly I didn't know what it meant before I had to put it on here. Almost all of this should be eliminated. Curse of knowledge in one cartoon because it's impossible for us to know what our readers don't know. What is the curse of knowledge? It simply doesn't occur to us that the reader doesn't know what we know. So we lard it with jargon and we just hope for the best. Uh, we have a very poor theory of mind, in fact. So uh, children have, have a poor theory of mind. A three-year-old who sees a toy being hidden while a second child is out of the room assumes that the other child will look for it in its actual location rather than where she, he or she last saw it. So this is a psychological experiment. It's, it's, it's proven over and over again. Now, when do we ever escape from this mindset? And in what circumstances? Probably I've never escaped totally from this mindset. So abbreviations and jargon are tempting to use for the careless writer, but if it saved you a few keystrokes to write an acronym or an abbreviation or some jargon that would have taken you five seconds to define or to explain without jargon, um, imagine how many downloads that paper is going to read and how much time compounded each reader is going to have to look up the word in Google. So you save a few seconds, but then you cost the audience many hours or days, depending on the circulation of your, uh, of your work. Sometimes people will just give up on jargon, right? I'm sure we've all had that experience. Like, I have no idea what that means. I'm not going to look it up. Forget it. OK. Um, how many of you know Anthony Bourdain, the celebrity chef and uh, travel writer and, and, and documentarian? So he has in his book, um, Kitchen Confidential, a chapter on how to make your food more like restaurant food. And there are only three rules. And the three rules are shallots, garlic, and butter. So is the, are, what are the shallots, garlic, and butter of scientific writing? Some have a legitimate basis, others do. Okay, so what are the sh garlic, shallots, and shallots, garlic, and butter? One is noun piles, or rather the lack of them in professional writing. Professional writers don't use nouns as adjectives, or at least they do not do so very often. Inexperienced writers do it all the time. An aluminum foil covered petri dish should be a petri dish covered with aluminum foil. I don't know why we'd want to do that, but sometimes we would. I put my sample on the semiconductor parameter analyzer table. Should be, I put my sample on the table with the semiconductor parameter analyzer. But don't go crazy. I put my sample on the table with the analyzer that measures the parameters of semiconductors. It's a little bit overboard, in my opinion. Use your best judgment. Pepperoni pizza is OK. It's just one noun modifying another noun. That's fine. It's accepted English. But err on the side of using uh, nouns as nouns. ATP formation should be formation of ATP. And the reason that we do this, and you probably don't notice that professional writers don't do this, but they don't do it, and it makes their writing better because it allows the verb to act on the direct object, not on a string of modifiers. And this is one of the, those pedantic rules, but it's not pedantic when you realize that writers in the New York Times and The Economist don't write like this, and that's why it's easier to read. Dangling participles. Make all references explicit. The banker's name is Mr. Costington, and he drives a Rolls Royce, comma, indicating that he is a rich man. The dangling participle is almost always signaled, signaled by the construction, comma, something ing. Rolls Royce indicating that he is a rich man. But what about, what about this? clause indicates that he's a rich man. The banker's name is Mr. Costington, and he drives a Rolls Royce. This name, because his name is Costington, uh, that's from The Simpsons, by the way, if you couldn't tell by the uh, figure here. This name indicates that he is a rich man. This name indicates he's a rich man. This, make references explicit. Again, just like in the case of dangling participles, this is always followed by a noun with no exceptions. So the problematic phrase is, the banker's name is Mr. Costington, and he drives a Rolls Royce. This indicates he's a rich man. This what? His job, the name, the fact that he drives a car, the fact that the car is a Rolls Royce. 
The preferred construction would be the banker's name is Mr. Costantin and he drives a Rolls Royce. This car indicates he is a rich man, if that's what you mean. Which and that, this is quite controversial. Which adds detail, whereas that is exclusive. Which is preceded by a comma and refers to the noun immediately before the comma. Note the difference in meaning between he took the ball, which was orange, or he took the ball that was orange. Specifically grab the ball that had the characteristic of having the color orange. However, which can also take the place of that. Which has a dual role. In, uh, but some, especially pedantic writers, don't believe this is true. <laughs> But uh, it's now accepted that which has a dual role. Which can also be exclusive, but that cannot. You would not say he took the ball that was orange. That wouldn't quite make, make sense. It would probably make sort of sense, but you wouldn't be able to divine exactly the meaning. Tense. Abstract is in the present tense according to the ACS style guide. Your results and the results of others in the literature are in the past tense. Smith et al. observed that the polymer was brittle. But scientific facts are in the present tense. These are things that you have to use your judgment a little bit as to what's a scientific fact, but something that is used over and over and over again. F didn't just equal MA when Newton found out that it equaled MA. F really does equal MA. Uh, so it's not F equaled MA. Um, perhaps a particularly obvious example, but there it is. If you forget what the convention is, just be consistent. Don't switch back and forth between present and past tense in the body of the, of the work. Active and passive voice. Um, there are some people who are passive voice police, some people who are active voice police. Uh, active voice is preferred, but not, uh, not exclusively. The first person, we, is okay to avoid uh, ridiculousness. A hot plate annealed the polymer at 150C would be ridiculous. I think we can all agree with that. We annealed the polymer at 150C and a hot plate is fine. In this case, though, the passive voice would have been better. The polymer was annealed by the hot plate. Sometimes passive voice is okay for emphasis. Your dog is chasing my cat has a lot less power in it than my cat is being chased by your dog because it allows us to put the heaviest or most important item at the end of a sentence, which is always a, a key for impactful writing. It's almost like the butter of impactful writing. Even if there's olive oil present and you've done the other things, there's also butter. Figures. Uh, the reader is not going to study your figures. The figures have to be pretty obvious from first glance. So arrange your figures in PowerPoint or Illustrator or whatever with a font size that seems monstrously big until shrunk to one column. When you shrink something to three inches, all that 12 point font that you made in an entire panel of Illustrator or uh, PowerPoint all looks like crap because you can't read any of it. In fact, our brains are a lot better at dis discerning detail in, in uh, pictures and schematic diagrams than we are in with, uh, with, with characters on a, on a screen. So it's okay if we shrink down the schematic diagram as long as it's still readable, the whole thing will, be, will look just fine. And here's a little rule of thumb. It, and especially when you're talking about color, is color necessary or distracting, especially in plots? Sometimes you could have like a whole rainbow of colors or gradients of colors, and, but really there's no point in doing that. It just, it just looks distracting. Sometimes, um, uh, sometimes just black, uh, black and white is, uh, is better, especially if you only have a few plots. Copy editing. And while the copy editor will do all this stuff for you, if you when you submit your paper, um, it looks really savvy to the peer reviewers who review your paper or to anyone that's, that's reading your, your, your work. Um, and this could be in a, in a company, in an academic lab, in an internship, anywhere. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it makes you look savvy to do the, some of the copy editing before it goes out. So variables are italicized, but the subscripts and superscripts are not. 
Superscripted references go outside the punctuation when placed at the end of a sentence, even if it doesn't make logical sense. But sometimes a particular publication to which you're submitting will have the opposite convention, but just make sure you know what it is. In the US, we do things stupidly. Commas and periods go inside quotation marks, period, end quote. In the UK, they go outside. This makes more sense, I think, but this looks better. Uh, one space after a period. Um, some people are really sticklers about two spaces after a period, but I'm pretty sure that came from some time in history when, uh, when um, we had typewriters and the hammers used to get stuck to each other or something like that. At least that's the layout of the keyboard. That's why it's so unusual. Um, but one space after a period looks better. This article from uh, six years ago in, on, on Slate um, does a nice takedown of, of the two space. Um, sorry if, if to anyone who uses two spaces, I did for a very long time, and I'm proud to say I've given up the habit. Double space your drafts, unless you're putting it into a template, like if you're preparing a manuscript for publication for grad students, or those of you who are going on to grad school, putting it in the, in the template. Um, is obviously single space, but it allows you to put your figures where they should be. Uh, use Arial or other sans serif fonts in your figures. What's a serif? It's the little bit on the top of the I and the bottom of the I and the top of the H and the bottom two things of, a, of an H that, give, that make prose somewhat easier to read in like a book, but make a figure look like it was made in uh, 1850 and um, has a little bit too much detail, uh, too much fine detail in the figure, and it actually makes the figure somewhat more difficult to, uh, to read. Use bigger fonts than you think you will need. For further reading, you can look at these slides again. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube over again because this was so entertaining. If you have five minutes, I would recommend George Whiteside's article on writing a paper in advanced materials. Um, I'm going to send these documents to uh, Professor Janeski so he can put them on, uh, on, um, online. If you have five to ten hours to read Steven Pinker's A Sense of Style, it's actually, I'm going to put this in my top like five nonfiction books of all time. It's really good. Uh, the ACS Style Guide, just for a reference. And, and Lamott, the bird by bird, but particularly the, the shitty first drafts uh, essay from it. Uh, the Economist has a great writing, great transparent writing style. I think it's a little bit better than the New York Times, and then the worst is, uh, is CNN.com. Sorry, it just is. Uh, Strunk and White, The Elements of Style. If you, if many of you have read that, or at least have seen it. Um, or had it been recommended to you before. But if you boil it down to only to the most useful advice is omit needless words. If you say you write your first draft or even your 10th draft and you say, I'm going to reduce the, the size by 30%, it's magic how much better the writing is. And that is it. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me for 45 minutes. And I will take questions uh, while I pack up my bags. <laughs>